Chapter 16 of the Boy Scouts in a Trapper's Camp by Thornton W. Burgess. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 The Conference. Sparrow's eyelids fluttered, then slowly lifted. Dully and uncomprehendingly, he stared up at a fretwork of bare brown branches against a background of blue. Where was he? What had happened? Then a throb of pain in his head cleared his senses and memory returned all too vividly. His brows contracted in a black scowl, and slowly and painfully he rolled over and got to his feet, staring about for his assailant. But of the outlaw there was no sign save the broken crust where the axe had plunged through. Nor was there any trace of the black fox save a little spot of crimson and two or three black hairs where the animal had lain. How long he had been unconscious he had no means of knowing, but it could not have been long, or he would have been frostbitten. As it was, he was merely chilled and numb from the cold. His head ached badly, and passing a mitten hand over it, he found a big lump where the axe had hit him. Moreover, he felt sick to his stomach, dizzy and weak, but for his physical ailments he had no thought. Wrath, black, boiling rage surged over him. He had been robbed. He had been treacherously outwitted. For the moment it was the latter fact rather than the former that was the cause of his hot resentment. He, Sparrow Muldoon, who had lived by his wits ever since he could remember, had been caught napping. A me with the drop on him, he exclaimed bitterly. He put me down for the count, but it was a foul. And I wasn't looking for no foul. Serves me right. He smiled bitterly. I ought to have known better than give him an opening. Serves me right for listening to his spiel. If I get a drop on him, he'll wish he'll never set eyes on Sparrow Maldoon. This was idle boasting, and Sparrow knew it. The chances that he would ever again set eyes on the wily redskin were exceedingly slim. Still, it was possible that Pat and Alec might be able to pick up his trail, and the sooner they were put wise to the affair, the better. He would get back to camp as soon as possible. He picked up his rifle, and even as he did so, a new thought flashed across his mind. Why tell of his experience at all? Why mention the black fox? He could explain the bump on his head by saying that he had slipped and fallen, striking his head against a log. Pat and Alec need never know that he had lost a rare pelt for them for all time, nor that he had been such a tenderfoot as to be outwitted by an Indian on whom he already had the drop. Why say a word about it? To tell would be likely to win for himself nothing but contempt, contempt for his weakness in parleying with the outlaw, and for his stupidity in being outwitted. But there was a hope, a faint one to be sure, but still a hope, that by some special favor of providence Pat and Alec might be able to trace his assailant and recover the skin. Not to tell would be to surrender without a fight, and this was directly contrary to the boy's nature. A double motive urged him to leave no stone unturned that might lead to the capture of the Indian, the desire to recover the rich prize and the spirit of revenge. He could tell of the robbery without in any way committing himself in the matter of the temptation which had led to the parley with the outlaw. This is what he would do. He didn't want his companions to think worse of him than was absolutely necessary. So with his mind made up to this course, he headed for camp. Click, clack, coward! Clack, coward. His very shoes mocked him. He tried to shut out the sound, but he could not. Had Edward Muldoon, Boy Scout, won over Sparrow Muldoon, Street Gaiman, only to lose in the end? Where the trail led close to the end of the big beaver dam, he stopped abruptly, and a last brief battle was fought between Scout and Gaiman. When it was over, he pushed on with an eagerness he had not felt before, for the Scout had triumphed and this time he knew that the victory was final. He would tell the whole story from beginning to end and spare himself nothing. "'Yous ain't no quitter,' he muttered to himself fiercely. "'Yous is going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth.' His progress was slow, and his snowshoes seemed strangely heavy. The fierce conflict within, not less than the effects of the blow he had suffered, had left him physically weak. He felt light-headed. His nervous system had received a shock from which he was now feeling the effects. He was possessed of a desire to sit down and rest every few minutes, but he set his jaws grimly and plodded on. 
Upton was outside the cabin splitting wood as he approached. He looked up as a click-clack of snowshoes caught his attention, and seeing that it was Sparrer, called cheerily, "'Well, look!' A shadow of his old-time impudent grin flashed across Sparrer's face as he replied, "'What luck would you be expecting with a tenderfoot like me?' "'The greatest luck in the world. It's always that way in stories,' retorted Upton. Then he noticed the pale face of the younger lad, and dropping his axe he sprang forward. "'Say, boy, what happened?' he demanded anxiously. "'You're white as a sheet. You hurt or have you had a fright? Spit it out.' "'A little of both, I guess.' confessed Sparr, sitting down wearily on a handy log. "'Are the others back yet?' "'Not yet. They're coming now,' replied Upton as a faint yell reached them. "'That's Hal, and by the sound of his voice they've had luck of some kind. But what happened to you?' "'It's a long story, and I'll tell you when the others get here,' replied Sparr. "'I think I'll go in and get a drink of something hot,' his teeth chattered. It was a result of nervous reaction quite as much as cold. Upton, with real concern on his face, sprang forward and put an arm around the shaking youngster and led him into the cabin, then hastened to make him a cup of hot soup. With this in his stomach, Sparr rapidly recovered, and by the time Pat, Alec, and Hal arrived, the latter whooping joyously, he was quite himself. They brought with them three Martin and a Fisher. When these had been duly admired, Upton demanded that Sparr tell his story and this he did, sparing himself nothing. At the first mention of the black fox there was an eager leaning forward on the part of all his listeners, and when he told of the successful shot Hal whooped with joy. "'Where is he?' he demanded. "'I don't know,' replied Sparr, and could not restrain a rather pathetic grin at the blank look of astonishment that swept over the four eager faces. Then he hurried on, blurting out a full confession of his temptation— and winding up with the incident of the axe-throwing and his final recovery of consciousness. "'The skunk didn't even leave me the rabbit,' he concluded. The faces of Pat and Alec changed rapidly from interest to astonishment to seriousness, anger, and determination. Both knew that murder and nothing less had been back at throwing of that axe, and that it was merely the accident of good fortune that Sparrow is with them now instead of lying a corpse out there in the beaver swamp. Pat reached forward and pulled Sparrow's cap from his head, disclosing an ugly lump where the blow had fallen. Till that moment no one had noticed that the boy had kept his cap on. You may thank the good God that it was the handle and not the blade that struck you, son. "'Twas he alone that saved you this time, exclaimed the big fellow, a note of reverence in his voice. "'Tis an ugly bump, he added, passing his fingers lightly over the swelling. "'Tis a wonder it didn't break your skull, it was. The cap saved you, I guess. Why didn't you tell us you had that nasty lump, young Spalpeen? It ought to have been treated long ago. It ain't nothing, replied Spire sheepishly, for he hated to have a fuss made over him. Upton was already heating water and preparing a bandage. As soon as the water was hot, he added a little tincture of arnica, and despite Spire's protest, a hot bandage was soon applied, and he was forced to admit that it brought almost immediate relief. This attention having been given the victim, Pat called a conference. "'It's plain enough,' said he, "'that this is the work of one of the black-hearted crooks who have been stealing the furs. For it is my belief that there is probably more than one, and likely not over two. Alec nodded concurrence with this belief. "'That they'll stop at nothing, Sparrow's experience proves. I've known murder to be committed for less than the price of a prime black fox spelt.' Now that they've got it, tis likely they will pull camp at once rather than take the chance of being discovered. On the other hand, they may think that their camp is so well hidden that they can just lie low. If, as I suspect, they have been run out of one of the Canadian lumber camps, this may be what they will do. They know that Spar here is a tenderfoot and that there is only his word against theirs. Besides, they can hide the pelt and deny all knowledge of it. Spar hasn't a shred of proof but the lump on his head and it would take more than that to convince the court of law in these parts that he had killed a genuine black fox. It's my opinion that their camp is a whole lot nearer than Alec has supposed. There are plenty of draws back in these hills where a camp could be hidden and discovered only by chance, unless someone was making special search for it. The fact that that bloody-minded engine was hanging around the beaver pond so late in the day is evidence enough for me that his camp isn't many miles away. 
I'll bet it's within five miles of us this blessed minute. They probably located our trap lines and built their camp in a place where we are not likely to visit, and then, by working back up through the hills, kept their trail hidden, and crossed on the ice to work our long lines, as Alex suspects. They left our short lines alone, partly because they could not get at them without leaving a trail in the soft snow, and partly as not to arouse suspicion. With the crust they could go where they pleased, and the engine took the chance to do a little poaching on the beaver pond, knowing that we would leave it alone. He probably saw Spar when he uncovered that trap, and followed him through the woods, either with the idea of finding out if the youngster suspected anything, and then frightening him into holding his tongue, or else just to keep track of his movements. He saw the killing of the fox and decided that the fortune in the pelt was worth any risk. What he told Sparrow about the skin belonging to Alec and me isn't true. This is a free country, and the free creatures belong to whoever can get them. If the critter had been one of our traps, it would have been a different matter. Then it would have been our property, for the critter belonged to nobody until it was killed. And when Sparrow knocked it over, every hair on that black hide belonged to him and to no one else. The cunning red skin made up that yarn to tempt Spar, and there wasn't a particle of truth in it. Now the question is, what are we going to do to get back Spar's property? If it was just an ordinary red fox or even a marten, the case would be different, although even then I'd be for getting it back and running these thieving poachers out of the country. As it is, we owe it to Spar to try to get that skin. What's your idea, Alec? Alec leaned forward and poked the fire. You can that the moon's full the night, said he slowly. I'm thinking that you and me might take a bit of a look around. If we could find the camp, it would be time enough to decide what to do next. I don't think with that prize they will be staying in these parts long. And what is done has got to be done quickly. I have no suspicion that the camp was handy till now. I am no saying that I think so now he hastened to add with a characteristic Scotch caution. But I will admit that it is possible. You can that there is no nook or hollow in these hills that I dinna can every foot of. I hid out here once myself. We can leave the laddies to get a wee bit of sleep while we have a look in the most likely places. No, you don't, protested Hal. If there's any game like that afoot, you can count us in. Can't they, fellows? Upton and Sparrer voiced eager assent. But Pat shook his head. Nothing doing, he declared. Alec and I are responsible for the safety of you fellows, and you'll stay right here and keep this little old cabin from running away. Besides, he added, noting the disappointment in the three faces, this is no play scouting. It is men's work and only for those who know the country. Two are all that are needed, and more would be double the chances of giving alarm. If Alec and I can locate the camp, we may need your help tomorrow in rounding up the thieves. So you will be good little boys and stay right here until you're needed. I was thinking of the moon before Alec spoke. When it is up, twill be almost as light as day. Twill do no harm for us to have a look around. Alec says true that he knows every foot of these hills and hollows. And if those birds of ill omen, bad cess to the likes of them, do not fly too soon... We'll come pretty close to locating em inside the next twenty-four hours. There's no use in starting before the moon is well up. Meanwhile, we'll have supper. I have no mind to travel on an empty stomach, and I have the appetite of a lumber horse this very minute. Any of that bear steak left, Alec? Alec promptly produced the desired meat, and it was soon sizzling over the fire. While they ate, they discussed what should be done in case the camp of the outlaws was discovered. "'Do you suppose they will fight?' asked Hal eagerly. "'Look at Sparrow there and ask sensible questions,' returned Pat sarcastically. "'Is a man who attempted cold-blooded murder likely to come at a whistle like a good doggy? "'We've got to take them by surprise, or somebody is likely to get hurt. "'That is why I want you boys to keep out of it. "'This isn't your business. It's Alex and mine. "'How about me? You said a while ago that that skin is mine,' piped up Sparrow. So it is, me bantam, but your own skin is worth more to you than all the silver foxes that ever lived, and if you cannot keep it whole yourself, it's up to us to keep it whole for you, retorted Pat. It isn't just a matter of that fox skin, he continued. I'm guessing that Alec and I have a good-sized stake in the skins cached in that camp right now. 
"'We had a little unpleasantness with those sneaking robbers of honest men "'to settle as soon as you left, and this has simply forced it a little sooner. "'It's our job, and you fellows are to stay out. That's final.' They knew by the tone of his voice that no amount of begging or argument would avail them in the least. They knew, too, that Pat was right in his stand. They were his guests, and as such entailed upon him a certain responsibility for their safety and welfare. "'But, Pat, can't we be in at the finish?' pleaded Hal. "'Gee, think of a real scrap going on under our very nose and we not seeing it.' "'Depends on what the finish is,' replied Pat." I'll promise you this much, that if there is anything to see, or if you can help without the risk of stopping a bullet or a knife, you shall have a chance. At present it looks like a dangerous game, but we'll know more when we found that camp. The greatest help you can give us now is to stay right here. We'll be back before daylight, and by that time we'll know enough, I hope, to plan some action. Alec, it'll be a couple of hours yet before we can start. Suppose we turn in for a bit of rest. It's little enough we're likely to get for the next twenty-four hours. We'll leave the lads to put the camp in order. This the boys were only too glad to do while the two trappers stretched out in their bunks and rested. Two hours later, Pat arose and peeped out. The moon flooded the hollow with light, and he grunted his satisfaction. A few minutes later, he and Alex slipped out, and almost at once were lost in the heavy shadows of the evergreens. Each carried his rifle and the two faces were set and grim. There was something sinister in this silent departure, and as they vanished into the vast brooding wilderness, the three boys instinctively drew nearer together. Al shrugged his shoulder and laughed, but somehow his laugh sounded oddly forced. "'Somebody kick me and tell me if I'm awake,' said he, throwing another log on the fire. "'You read about such things and think it's a bully story.' but somehow the story seems more real than the reality. Of course, nothing's going to happen to Pat and Alec, yet just the same they are out with rifles hunting sure enough bad men, and if there's any shooting, somebody's likely to be hurt. If it wasn't for Sparrer's bandage head there, I'd think I was dreaming. How's the old nut feel anyway, Sparrer? Better, but sore enough to let me know this ain't no dream, returned the younger lad. Say! he exploded abruptly. What will the fellers say when we get back and tell them we've been fighting outlaws? And it all gets a knockout from a sure enough engine. Bet they'll wish they was in my shoes. Upton laughed. He was still boy enough to appreciate Sparrer's feelings. As long as you had to get it, I'm glad it was a real redskin who put it across, said he. As for fighting, it doesn't look to me as if we're going to see any of it. Pat isn't going to take any chances on one of us getting hurt. It makes me sick every time I think of the close call Sparrer had. If Pat and Alec find the camp of those brutes, they won't do anything rash. They'll try to trap them some way. They're right about us, but just the same I wish we could be in it somehow. I'd like to see the finish. Perhaps we shall yet, Al spoke hopefully. Shall we turn in? What's the use? returned Upton. I couldn't sleep a wink until Pat and Alec get back. We ought to keep the fire going and have something hot ready for them when they get in. Suits me, declared Hal. I couldn't sleep either. Sparrer was of the same opinion, so they sat before the fire and speculated on what was happening out there in the forest. Sparrer was plied with questions about his adventure and told the story over so graphically that the thrill of it sent little shivers down the backs of his listeners. At times they sat in silence, wondering if they might hear distant rifle shots. And so the night wore on, the most exciting night in their experience, and yet a night in which, so far as they were concerned, nothing happened. End of chapter 16